Let's see if that works. Well, yes, sir. Did. Awesome. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here uh, for this October uh, Issues Forum sponsored by the Columbia Chamber. And uh, we appreciate everybody attending, being here. I know it's uh, difficult for getting people off to school. We appreciate all of our uh, candidates' uh, time and um, taking out their busy schedules during, during the season to get out and speak to the public. So um, we're going to um, ask each candidate uh, before we get into uh, the questions I have, and I'm going to ask for audience participation as well. So I will, I will give breaks for people to have uh, opportunities to ask questions. But um, after I give each candidate the opportunity to um, tell us a little bit about themselves, which district or at large they are representing, um, we're going to have a list of 10 questions or so. And uh, Meg is going to be nice enough just so that we need to stay on course and we get to cover all the questions to kind of give you a a wave. Um, we're not going to treat it like a you know presidential debate where we're going to just cut you off, but mm -hmm. just try to shorten it up from there. So, but greatly appreciate everybody being here today. And um, I guess starting with Aaron, if you don't mind, um, giving us a little background on, on um, your role currently on council. And I know you're running out of post, just a little bit about yourself. Be great. Thank you for uh, being our host, uh, and thank you to everyone who uh, found that robbery to be here this morning. Hopefully the coffee helps you out because it's going to definitely help me out. Uh, I am a, a product of School District 1, as well as I am also a parent of School District 1. I can tell people I have a 13-year-old that will be the next to date in my county. He's uh, 6'4", uh, 205 pounds, wears a size 14 shoe. Uh, he dominated in the Carolina Gamecocks uh, camp this summer as an eighth grader. He got MVP honors. I'm also a husband of 22 years from Georgia Peak with a Georgia Peach out of Atlanta, Georgia, who was my college sweetheart. I'm also a faith leader here in the city of Columbia. Uh, also, uh, me and my wife co own an academy. Um, uh, I think she owns it, I just kind of drive her around. Um, but um, also, I just recently received my PhD um, in organizational leadership. From Columbia International University here uh, in our city. So I think that gives you a gist of who I am, but I'm very active and very passionate about being a product of this, of this community and return on investment. Thank you. Thank you. Now, please. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Hamilton Jacobs. And just like Commissioner Bishop said, I'm a proud parent product and partner of Richmond School District 1. I'm the founder of non, uh, the nonprofit Bridge Over Foundation. Uh, also, I'm a husband. I'm a parent of four sons, uh, two at Kaufman Road Elementary School, one at Southeast Middle School, and my oldest at Lower Richmond High School. Uh, I am a, also a elder at Lord Temple Worship Center in Hopkins, South Carolina. Um, very involved with our youth, uh, Pop Warner coach, a AAU basketball coach and a concerned community advocate. Um, I've spent my last days and most of my days, the last uh, decade, making sure that our children have a safe haven, making sure that we give them resources, that we expose them to a world of endless possibilities. And I am excited to be running for Richland County uh, School District 1 board seat at large. I'm looking forward to trying to propel our district forward and uh just giving us a chance to let our children shine oh, i'm sorry oh, go ahead. thanks so much uh robert lamanac and i'm running on district three seat in district one which could be confusing um i'm originally from greenville but i've lived in um columbia since 2000. i was a lawyer for about 15 years and then became a school teacher hand middle school and Dreer high school I uh, started a nonprofit called Achieve Columbia, and after seven years of teaching, uh, took over the nonprofit full time uh, and am running that uh, now. Uh, it's a nonprofit that advocates for public education in the state house um, and and runs a program at an elementary school. And I've got two children, uh, one who's a junior at USC, and I've got a senior at uh, Dreer. And uh, you'll be surprised to know when you look at me that he actually is going to play basketball in college next year. So thank you all for being here. Thank you, Robert. Richard. Good morning. My name is Richard Moore. I, I like to tell people I've been with Richmond District 1 since first grade. So that's been a long time. 
So I've seen things from the um, student perspective, from the parent perspective. As an employee, I spent um, about 30 years as a principal in the district and several years teaching and uh, also spent about five years in the human resources office. Um, I went to Carolina where I got my um, first degree in elementary uh, education and then a master's in elementary administration and then a PhD in early childhood education. In fact, I think I was probably one of the first PhDs in early childhood education at the university. That program was just getting started. Uh, I have been married for 45 years. My wife is with me this morning. She's been with me every, every day all along the way. Uh, we have four boys who are all products of Richland One, and we now have eight grandchildren who all attend Richland One, everything from kindergarten through 11th grade. So um, as a parent, grandparent, teacher, employee, student, and now as a, grand, as a volunteer in a number of our schools, uh, I've known the district and been with the district for a long time and would love to be able to offer that expertise and use my voice and my vote to help improve things in the district. Um, we, uh, we have uh, been, a, I've been a part of the district so long that I feel like it's a part of the family and that's part of the reason why I decided that I would run. Great, thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are you? Thank you for being out so early this morning. I am Barbara Fleming Weston. I'm from the large town of Eastover. And what um, I'd like for you to know about me is that I too am a product of Richland School District 1. Um, when I was in the fifth grade, my parents decided that they would check out School of Choice. And so they um, actually decided that I would go to Lower Richland High School, not knowing that I would have to go to Eastover Elementary because Lower Richland then was seven to 12. Um, but then did go to Lower Richland High School, graduated in 1972 when 18-year-olds got the right to vote. And so this is not my first run at the school board because I thought I could tell them something back then. They thought differently. So I went on to South Carolina State University um, and got uh, my degree in English, speech, and drama. From there, I went on to um, get my masters from Cambridge, and then my plus 30 from USC Furman College of Charleston. I am very proud to say that after leaving there, I was a teacher recruiter at the Center for Teacher Recruitment, which is now called Sarah. I also um, was 1986 Teacher of the Year from Keenan High School, and um, then 1995, I was the Teacher of the Year from Five Points Alternative High School, um, and just found that everything is all about the children. And so that's where my interest lies. And I've served on the State Board of Education. I've been a representative with priority schools and working for the State Department. I have served on several boards, so I know policy and governance. And my vision for Richland One is to make it one of you. Great. Thank you so much, Meg. How much? What, what time are we going to allow for each? Two minutes. Okay. Barbara, I'm going to stick with you. And so that I don't make you repeat uh, something that you probably just covered in terms of you know your background and your, and your challenge and your opportunities for the original one. I have a question on here that I think would be appropriate for you given your background in recruiting. Um, and I will let all the candidates answer, uh, answer this as well. But talk about the, the shortage of teachers, um, the challenges around that, how that's impacting the classroom, and how you or all y'all as board members look to address that. We have that challenge all over the United States. In particular, Richland One um, has outdone themselves by having a lot of vacancies and overcrowding the classroom. I think that there needs to be a new approach to recruiting teachers, and that is retaining the ones that we have. And those teachers, if they are happy, if they're safe, and they feel comfortable, they will recruit others because they will tell them what a wonderful place it is to work but they're not doing that. Um, another thing that we could do to actually um, recruit teachers is start recruiting them when they come to do student teaching at our schools and just give them a job position there before they leave and seek elsewhere for a job. Uh, we could also look at Project BOLD. Uh, the OLD is through the um, Student Loan Corporation, which I'm a trustee there. 
And they're saying that decide who's going to go out and they're going to become teachers if they're there and then pay for their education and require them to serve the district in another way. So think outside the box for recruiting teachers, but first make them feel comfortable in their own schools so they will recruit the teachers back to register one. Thank for your same question. I spent five years in the human resources office and uh, one of my major responsibilities there were recruiting teachers for the district. And one thing that I learned is that a, a really important part of all of that is the speed and the timing with which you use if you're gonna get the good teachers and hang on to them. I think as uh, Barbara's right, we need to start when we have student teachers in our buildings that are doing a good job and lock them in as quickly as possible. And then we need to be very responsive um, that, that seems to be a theme in a lot of things that I hear from people is about being responsive. And I, I hear it, especially from people who say they've applied for the district and they haven't heard back, and so they're going somewhere else. Um, I think that's a, that's a big issue. I think teachers, in addition to needing uh, to be comfortable and safe in their environment, they also need to feel supported and they need to feel challenged. Um, the classroom is a learning environment for everybody. And uh, once you have teachers who are feeling all of those things in the classroom, then they're your, your top recruiters. They're the ones who will go out and say to people, Richland District 1 is the place to work and the place to be and the place where we learn and where students learn. Um, I think they, we have to, um, in addition to that, have a lot of the programs that are already in place. And there are some things in place for recruiting teachers and for getting teachers to stay in our district but apparently those things aren't working as they were intended to. And so I think we need to look very closely at the things we're doing and see if there are other things we can try um, and, uh, and also <clears throat> spend time evaluating the things that we're doing and finding out how effective they are. Thank you. Thanks. Um, when I was a teacher, one of the biggest complaints I would hear was about HR and payroll. That was uh, you know, 10 years ago. When I ran for office a year ago, I would ask teachers, what are the biggest problems? HR and payroll. Um, that's still one of our biggest problems. Uh, last year, we had a presentation about HR. And I asked the director of HR how things were going. And he said, teachers in our district feel supported. And I remember saying, I'm astounded to hear you say that because that's not what I hear. At the end of the year, we lost 400 teachers. It's more teachers than any district in the state. I am so tired of hearing about the national and state issues when we as a district will are refusing to address our own issues. We lose teachers at four times the rate of the state average because of school leaders. And yet we are not looking at our high teacher turnover schools. We've got some schools that lose five or six percent of teachers a year, which is wonderful. We've got, we've got other schools that are losing 40 or 50 percent of their teachers every single year. Um, we cannot continue down this path. We have more vacancies than Greenville and Charleston combined right now. And what that's doing to our current teachers is increasing their classroom sizes, putting more burdens on them. And I'm hearing people who are starting to talk about leaving either in the middle of the year or at the end of this year. We literally cannot afford to continue to hemorrhage teachers if we really care about the kids. We got to do better. And if we can't fix HR and payroll, we will not be able to fix this problem. Just yesterday, I heard we didn't pay our subs. Uh, I got messages every week from teachers who haven't been paid appropriately or on time. That is the most basic responsibility of the district. In fact, if you look at our very one-sided contract with our teachers, that is our only obligation is to pay our teachers, and we're not doing it appropriately. So I think if we can fix some of those uh, very fundamental things, we'll start seeing an improvement in our retention rate. I believe that um, I have to play to my strong suit. My strong suit is community. Uh, speaking with a lot of administrators and speaking with teachers, uh, a lot of them are asking for support. So I believe that in order for us to retain our teachers, in order for us to make sure that uh, our teachers feel comfortable, feel that they can trust to make our district attractive, we have to partner with our community uh, leaders, uh, liaisons, our nonprofits, those people that are willing to come into our schools 
and give the lead time teachers so that they can get away from the classroom for a second, so they can get a little bit, so they can feel comfortable and uh, have enough strength and stamina to go back in the classroom and finish it out during the course of an eight hour day. Um, I see and I notice that um, when we speak with teachers and when we have these conversations, a lot of these conversations are without the teachers. I believe before we can do anything, before we can make any decision, we need to speak with our teachers, find out what they need, what they're saying, um, what they want in their classroom, what changes they may like to have made. And then we have to uh, meet those needs. And I believe that we'll be able to see retention in the classroom. Our district will be more attractive. Uh, we won't have, I think every time you have a cloud over the district, when you hear things about HR, you hear some of the other disparities that are said, it makes people not want to come to the district. We have to make sure that we are taking our time to fortify and strengthen our district so that it can be attractive and people want to come and work in the original school district. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question again. Uh, it's, two, it's two things, being competitive and effective. Uh, competitive means that what we do as a system uh, makes people definitely want to uh, be a part of this district. Uh, when we look at uh, even what is a struggle, as Dr. Weston said, a nationwide struggle, and we have to own ours, right? We have to make sure that we look at it from the original one lens. And um, if we look at it from a wide range, it's, it's an issue just not with teachers, but it's also an issue with bus drivers, cafeteria workers. There's a shortage everywhere. And it could be some credence to the way we're processing things from payroll, HR uh, applications, it could be a range of stuff. But I think what we are definitely um, needing to recognize that it starts with our teachers as well. I'm not saying teachers are more important than our custodians or any other occupation, but teachers are the gatekeepers. They're the gatekeeper to our future. They're the, they're the students, um, mother and parent doing the eight hour shift of the day, right? And so what I want to do is make sure that we're constantly supporting them. And the best way you can support them is to listen. And as a, as a governing body, as a school board, we need to make sure that whatever we're hearing, we bring back to the superintendent, make sure that he's held accountable to maybe fixing any of those issues that are making sure that our teachers are being heard. Um, another thing about being effective is that uh, we look at achievement gaps, but we need to look at um, uh, employment gaps. Uh, maybe boomers are real. <laughs> And as the baby boomers are exiting the workforce, there's not enough teachers coming through the colleges. Um, right, right here in Columbia, I think at Columbia College, there's a program called the Call Municipal Program. We literally should be walking into Columbia College, literally almost sitting in that classroom and trying to get those teachers who are right in our footprint. If not, they'll go to Richmond too. They'll go to another district. So I think we need to be competitive and effective. Sticking with you, Aaron, since you're uh, already on, on board and serving, um, and this is a good question for the entire group, but tell me how y'all view um, your responsibility as being your uh, fiduciary and fiscal budgets, um, which are often talked about in the newspapers and social media about the Richmond one budget versus other counties budgets, but also in doing that, not to lose the, the, the um, student experience, the teacher experience. Can you, can you ask the question again? I think I was sure. Ready. Yeah, so like, I guess I'm gonna read directly off. Okay, sure. How about that? So what do you feel is the school board's responsibility to parents and the community on providing quality education and managing district's funds? How should the board be held accountable? I think it has to be funding alignment with operational alignment. And making sure every time we take a vote or we put things into play by way of action, and it's aligning with the strategic plan. With the strategic plan being executed in the public, it provides transparency. But beyond just transparency and allowing the, the teachers, the family, the community to see what we are putting in place as resources, we also got to hear from them when we do our budget uh, review. That's why we go to the communities and let uh, all of our community come in and give us feedback. I think also what it's going to help is increasing stakeholder equity but through, through trust, through relationships, through town halls, through mm -hmm. just Helping people get in front of uh, our top tier or our brass of our district so they can hear not just from us, but from the community. When we when we strengthen our community by informing them and letting them inform us, then it's, 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 it's a shared responsibility of what happens from the 
classroom all the way to the boardroom. And I'm glad that we have this conversation at the Chamber of Commerce mm -hmm. because we should have this conversation here, we should have it at the State House, we should have it in our churches, we should have it every, in every community because it's a village concept. If it takes a village to raise a child, then who's raising the village? Who's increasing the village awareness of things that they can bring in as stakeholder equity in the district? And therefore, we can make sure that we're impacting the classroom because it protects the village of the child and who's raising the village. Okay. And same question, I'm happy to repeat it. Yes, please. Yeah, so the question is, what do you feel is the school board, school board's responsibility to parents and the community on providing a quality education and managing the district's funds, how should the board be held accountable? I believe that number one, as a parent, I want to be informed. So of course, um, at the top is going to be transparency, but also we have to make sure that we're fiscally responsible. We have to make sure that we're informed and we're in tune with everything that's going on in the district. And for our students to get quality, uh, quality education and make sure that they are getting everything they need in the classroom, uh, I go back to being informed. You have to know what's going on at the school level. Now, these things come uh, from our administration and throughout the superintendent and that's as a government board. I feel that we should be held accountable as if we don't get the information, we have to go do it. Uh, I'm a worker, I'm a doer. So if I'm asking for reports or I'm asking for information and I'm not receiving it, then I'm gonna go do what it takes to get that information so that I can be effective in making change, making sure that what's provided, what needs to be provided for our students to get a quality <laughs> education, they get that. Like I said, as a parent, we have to be informed. As a stakeholder, um, as a constituent of the district, we have to be informed. So I think everyone, uh, as Commissioner Bishop said, everyone has to be um, line upon line, precept upon precept, making sure that everyone hears what's going on. If we have to do town halls, if we have to do forums, if we have to get out there and figure out a way for um, the stakeholders of Richmond School District one to feel comfortable and that they can trust what we are doing as it relates to our finances in the district. So we have to be transparent. We have to find that uh, that happy medium where our people feel comfortable with knowing what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we've got a half a billion dollar budget almost. And so um, more than anything, we need public trust. And so we've got to be willing, I think, to admit the areas that we're failing, uh, because the one way you absolutely lose the trust of the public, but just as importantly, our teachers and staff, is when we at the board level pretend like nothing's wrong. And so then when it comes time for uh, budgeting a half a billion dollars, we don't have the trust we need. Um, I think one of the things that we could do, and for example, you know, when you lose a teacher, it costs about $18,000 to replace them. So we just spent more money than any district in the state just replacing teachers we should have kept. But I think also at board meetings, we could do a better job. And it's hard because we've got a lot to cover. And I realize everybody's trying to get in and out, but we could do a better job of explaining some of the issues we're voting on. I think we understand it because we're reading everything ahead of time and preparing but really explaining uh, some of the financial things that we're voting on, the difference between Title I funding and Title II funding, um, and letting, trying to let the public in and understand what those issues are, can provide a little bit of, a little bit more context around our votes so that people feel like they understand why we're spending that money, um, maybe some of the constraints around how we spend that money, I think that would go a long way. But at the end of the day, if we continue to pretend like we're doing everything right, uh, and people know otherwise, we will not have trust when we're voting on spending our money. Uh, I hear people say all the time, um, say positive things so people want to come work there. It's not like the teachers don't know what the problems are. It's not like our staff don't know what the problems are. They're seeing it every day and they're talking to other teachers and they're talking to other community folks. We're not hiding it from anyone. It just makes us look like we either don't care or we're just lying about it. And that does not help us when it, when we're when we're using half a billion dollars of taxpayer dollars of taxpayer money. Okay. You know, the, the board has a responsibility to um, establish the vision for the district and then to uh, oversee how that vision is implemented by the administration. And um, that includes financial oversight and financial responsibility. 
which means board members need to know where the money's going and what it's being spent on and how effective uh, those programs are that we support. It's interesting that we've talked a lot about being transparent and having information. And uh, honestly, after having been in the district for 66 years, I'm not sure today that I even know what the vision is. And so providing information and making sure that I have that information uh, is something that becomes my responsibility as a board member, but it's also something that the board is responsible to the public for. And just recently, we talked about uh, relinquishing the board's power to look at contracts at certain uh, financial levels. And we would go from the board actually having to see every $50,000 contract to, you know, the ceiling is the limit is a possibility. And you know, that doesn't instill in the community uh, any kind of trust for where that money's going and how it's being spent. Um, and I think also I agree with the fact that you know, we, we don't seem to want to address those issues. And in fact, when those issues come up at board meetings, there are times when it seems as if we're even um, deliberately trying to move, that, move the discussion away from that issue. The administration, as I see it, does not provide information to the board so they can make good decisions, and that means the public is not going to get information either. And when board members repeatedly have to ask for information and don't get it, and other board members don't insist that they get it, then that's a problem. Thank you, Barbara. I think that transparency, accountability, and responsibility are hand in hand. The board, if they have a vision, they have not shared it with us. And how can we try to apply that vision if they're not, they don't even know what it is? The buck stops at the top. And so the school board has only the job of hiring and firing the superintendent. They do not have that luxury, I would say, in doing anything else. And so they have to hold the superintendent accountable for getting information, sharing information, and making sure that the board members have that information. If I were to go to work and did not do my job, what would you do to me? And so I think the book stops there. We have to reevaluate where we stand, where they stand, and what we're going to do about it. But if you're not getting the information, there is no way you can make an informed decision. Financially, the district has lost by not having someone sign off on Title I money about $5,000. Um, they've allowed people who have worked there to misuse money. And if you're doing that, and we're seeing that, what do you expect us to believe and think is right and that you're being good stewards of our money. And so as a taxpayer, as someone who's lived in the district all of her life, I'm afraid that we're going to lose not just teachers, bus drivers, janitors, um, all of those people. We're losing our children. And our main job is to save and educate our children. And we can't do that if we're not informed. Great answers, everybody. We're going to take a quick break and see if there's any questions from the audience. Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Barbara, you just hit the nail on the head. It seems to me that everything you've all talked about is really an issue of leadership. And I'm going to go out of the limb here. I mean, I think it's time to take a look at who is the superintendent of this district. So I would like each of you to respond to that issue of leadership. And what are you going to do about it? Because I think that's the problem. Thank you. Who about to go first? <laughs> I have already stated my um, stance on that. And I think it is the leadership. And as I said, the only person that we would be responsible for as the board is the superintendent because he is responsible for everybody, all the staff members, 
and everybody else. He can reassign people at will, whether they're doing well or not, um, and not even offer, uh, say anything about why he's doing it and not having to say that. So we're losing a lot of people. If we look in surrounding districts, you'll see a lot of Richland one teachers, administrators uh, who are going there so that they can be happy. And so it does start there. And so we have to reevaluate his position. The board is responsible for the superintendent. And at a recent meeting, we could not even be told when the superintendent's evaluation is going to take place. That does not make sense to me. When we know we have issues that are continuing issues and don't seem to be getting better, when we know we're not being provided with information about those issues, because the superintendent obviously does not want us to have that information because he's got all those people at his uh, disposal that could provide that information. When recently someone asked for a job description for new job positions, there wasn't anybody in the room who would even say, just go to the website and punch it up. There should be a job description there. No one, they came asking for new positions, not prepared to share with the job description of those positions. Now, whether or not an individual board member had done their homework is not the issue to me. When I'm elected as a board member, I have a responsibility to get the any information I need for my own knowledge to know how to decide things and also any clarification I need. And I would expect that even if it took poor old Richard five times to hear the question before he could make up his mind and give his input, that the other board members would be you know, supportive of however long that took and get me the information I need to have to make those decisions. That's not happening. And as Barbara said, that starts at the top. And if we can't even be open about when, when we're going to evaluate the superintendent, then I don't know where the process goes from there. I don't know how we trust in, in the process at all and as to what's going to happen next. Um, you know, I've been requesting some information that I think we should get every year just in the normal course of being on the school board. For example, uh, the teacher turnover for each school at the end of the year. Uh, we make a ton of decisions over the summer about reassigning folks, and I think we could ask much more intelligible questions if we had that information. Still haven't gotten that, as well as some other information. Um, I, this wasn't fun for me, but I did move that we terminate the superintendent's contract um, about a month or six weeks ago. Um, you know, our contract is written so that we can do that at any time. Uh, and I believe that the contract was written that way because we've got to be able to protect the district if we feel like we're headed in, in the wrong direction. And we are. I mean, we are in a ditch. And if we have a year this year like we did last year and lose another 20% of teachers, it's a, that's going to be 15 years of trying to repair the damage. And I just do not think that we can afford it. I don't think it's spared our teachers and staff. I think we need new leadership, uh, a new direction. And that's why I made that motion. Obviously, it was voted down. Um, and that's how that's how school boards work. But I, I really do think that at this point in, in, in the district, um, we really do need to change direction and show that we're willing to make that hard call uh, to move in a different direction. As a parent, when my children do something that I don't agree with or they don't give me information, I hold them accountable as a supervisor. On the job, when your employee doesn't do something that they're supposed to do, don't fulfill a duty, you hold them responsible. I believe as a governing board, I can only speak for myself. If the superintendent does not do what he's supposed to do, then I hold him accountable. Now, accountable or accountability comes as a layer facet. You have different layers of accountability. But as I said, I'm a worker. So those things that some of us alluded to on this panel this morning, if I don't get that information, I'll go get the information and ask, well, why wasn't this revealed to me? Or what was, where was the breakup in the administration? If someone was supposed to give you some information or tell you something that they needed to report to you, 
and you didn't get it as a result of us asking you for it and you could not provide it, then we need to find in the chain of command where was the link in the chain or the break in the chain. So I believe that as a governing board or as a commissioner, I would hold him accountable. I would ask those hard or those tough questions. We all have to do it. I do it as a parent. You do it as a supervisor. We have to ask the tough questions. But we have everyone must be held accountable. You know, this is a courageous conversation because when you're talking about a CEO, and I don't know how many people are CEOs out there, there has to be some level of accountability to your position. As a school board member, yes, I'm very aware that it's my job to hold that employee, the superintendent, accountable. But I also have to hold myself accountable to my responsibility and to making sure that quarterly, I'm checking in with my board to check in with him to make sure he's on track, all the districts on track. We had to have that in about two or three years, a quarterly review with the superintendent. So as a CEO, do you just get <clears throat> your walking papers, you know, without any type of um, what is called uh, performance improvement conversation? Uh, or you just literally have to walk out the door. When we look at the process of a superintendent and going to the contract, it's going to take a 5 2 vote. Okay, it takes a 5 2 vote, but it has to be also with some great reason why that 5 has voted that person out. If not, we may be in a place where the, the district is in a place of liability. This board recently. Um, was recognized as on a national level for being a board of excellence. And I think when we look at the board of excellence, you have to do your job into making sure that a board, you hold that superintendent accountable. And so this month, which is October, to answer some of your questions about evaluation, and this is when the evaluation happened. And I believe if one of our board members can uh, agree, we do have that tool in our hand. So the evaluation is about to happen for the superintendent. <laughs> And so the matrix and the evaluation of data is going to tell us how this process goes. And as a board, we have to do our job. And that's very plain and simple. We have to do the process according to the process, and the evaluation will determine what happens. You may not want to hear the concrete answer, but that is how it goes. Because if you ask for one person's opinion, then it's not the political process. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience before I go back to my sheet? I'll give right back. Uh, I'm all on. Okay. Um, I just wanted to ask a follow up, Mr. Bishop. You just said that in the past few years there had not been check ins with the superintendent. Can you tell us why and how that's changing moving forward? The short answer is COVID. That sometimes we were trying just to build this plan by flying it and getting sure, getting the recovery plan underway, the reopening plan. And um, that, that's something that we have to definitely take advantage of uh, to make sure that we are on track. Uh, that will happen. That will be uh, reinstituted because I think when you have those greatest conversations with your superintendent, you know where the health of the district is. And there are some successes. And I don't want to go through the laundry mat of it, but you know, the graduation rate was one of them. Several of the 16 pathway of career, career clusters were underway. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. But there are some challenges that need to be addressed. And once they are addressed, I think we can right this ship. If not, then it's a big problem. It's a bigger problem. But I think in this evaluation, which is going to be a very courageous conversation with the superintendent, we're going to see where we have some exposure. We're going to see where we have some success. And believing moving forward, that has to be reinstituted. Thank you. Let me try this again. This could be a simple question. Yes or no? Is it time for a new superintendent at Richland? Why? Yes. 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 Second time. I'm in support of the removal of anyone with cause. Anyone that's not doing their job with cause, I'm in support of their removal. My answer still stays true to what I said. The process is the process. And when we vote according to that tool and that matrix, 
The answer will be one answer, the board's answer. That might be my answer. Forgive me for my ignorance. Is that a value to the board? Uh, it will be once we dispose of it when we discuss what the board's uh, evaluation is. But there's some levels of, of personnel privilege where it has to be in this file. Sure, I understand that the results will be external to itself. And then is there a deadline or a timeline for when that evaluation happens? Uh, that evaluation should be coming up between this month, maybe not even far as early as next month, but it should be this month. That was the basis of my question. We've all talked about transparency, but how do we as a community know how the evaluation goes? Because there's so much chatter within schools and neighborhoods and frustration. But how can we as the public access what happens after that evaluation occurs? Or better yet, will the evaluation tool be available to the public prior to him completing that? <laughs> or when will we see it or know what it is? And will it be measurable goals that you're setting? Because if I'm just trying to do something, I'll always pass. But are there measurable goals that will be in that evaluation? And to remember the same kind of thing that you do with teachers when reassigning them, remembering that they're people and you should give them a chance to correct any things that they're doing, then that should still be the standard but if you're not even going to give that to teachers, why are you giving it to the superintendent? Um, it seems like I'm going to get back and then come back for a couple more audience questions. But one thing I'd like to know, we've all, it seems like we've the same uh, items of discussion, transparency, accountability, uh, supervision, teacher retention, um, um, student experience. Setting aside those five items that we've all talked about, if you have your magic wand on January 1, whenever you know, you're term starts or when your uh, first term start starting with you Barbara what would you like to implement? I think that what I'd like to implement has already been discussed what I'd also like to do is change the culture of the district our teachers <laughs> our bus drivers our cafeteria workers everybody is stressed out they are, they don't feel secure in their positions they don't feel able to speak out and be heard or recognized. Um, they're walking on pins and um, walking on eggshells. And so I think that I would like for the culture to change and also take a look at how we are hurting students. And I'll say it that way, walking through metal detectors, going into a building um, looking like it's a prison, is not the way that we provide safety to our the children. We need in our schools, not just guidance counselors, but we need people who are going to come in and talk about conflict resolution, uh, people who are going to come in and talk about mental health. Our students have been away from school for about two years and their social skills are missing. They are forgetting what's happening in the classroom and they've taken over a media uh, position there. So we want to address the culture of the school, the safety of the school, and the SROs are good, metal detectors are good, but you have to have the skills and the mental aptitude to actually get things done and make our schools a pleasant place to be and welcoming not only to the students, but also to the community and to the parents, because some schools, they won't even let you in. And I understood it during COVID, but even now they're not a welcoming environment. So those are some things I'd like to address. Thank you for your welcome. I didn't know that I was running for a magic wand. That's a good, that's a good <laughs> concept. I, like I know that. you can't get all seven votes, so I'm gonna give you seven right here. All right. Yeah. So um I, you know, to me it seems as though the first thing that I would like to, to work on and have happen is for the board to come together as a team. That doesn't mean you agree on everything, but it means that you know how to agree to disagree, and it means you know how to reach consensus in trying to do what's the best thing for the district. You don't educate children in masses. You can feed them in masses, you can transport them in masses, you can make plans for them in masses, but you have to educate children 
individually one at a time and that requires building relationships and that means that the board as a part of the vision if, if i could make a change would come together enough to try to ensure do whatever they could to ensure that every child in the district has a relationship with an, an adult a responsible adult that encourages them and supports them whether it's their parent, if it's their parent, then great, job done, we don't have to worry about that. But it may have to be the teacher, or it may be the custodian, or it may be the lunch lady, or it may be the bus driver. It could be the principal or the guidance counselor, doesn't matter, but that relationship has to be there. So I guess if I had the magic wand, what I'd want to do is to wave it and have the board come together with that understanding. Not that we want to run the school, not that we don't understand the chain of command, not that we don't know that the administration is important, but that that vision includes those relationships for children that make such a difference. And we talk about security and having um, SROs and having metal detectors, and I'm afraid, unfortunately, we're stuck with that in today's society. But those people that caused us to get there, that have created that problem, were people who needed a relationship at one time or another there was somebody's baby and somebody's kindergarten child. Thank you. And as a follow-up to both y'all's points, when Dr. Davis and Dr. Lifton spoke, we brought school safety, and I, I can't remember the, the exact statistics, but I believe there were more uh, incidents where they found weapons on somebody based on the SRO being told by a student or a student on a teacher rather than being called from actual metal detector, mm -hmm. which is very interesting. So that was in our uh, issues form about two months ago. Sorry for that side note, Robert. Please go ahead with your magic wand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I mean, I know you told me that we couldn't uh, address this, but I, the teacher shortage, I mean, if we don't fix that, nothing else matters. I mean, if we don't have enough teachers and adults in our school buildings, then all of our great ideas will be meaningless. I think if I could change anything, though, I, I was talking to somebody who um, has trained some of our folks at the administrative and school level, and they said, culture eats strategy. And what I'm seeing in District 1 is very little strategy, but whatever it is, it is being eaten up by the culture. We've got to change the culture. Uh, the board is not the defender of the administration at all costs, and that's what it's been doing. And the costs are our teachers and students. And if we do not change that culture, then we will continue to be a disservice to our teachers and our students. We've got to change that culture. I had a magic wand last year. I learned from this gentleman. I ran for the same position. And I believe that both Mr. Moore and Ms. Weston talked about it. Last year, I was talking about changing the climate and the culture of our schools, making sure that we brought back the community aspect, the village aspect. Uh, throughout the course of the day, I've been telling you that I can only work or talk about what I do. I'm in the schools every day. This is not a part-time job. Don't take off. My oldest son is 15 years old. He's a sophomore in high school. Since he's been four years old, I've been working in this district. I've been creating the relationships that we talked about that provide that trust, that provides and helps the safety that needs to be in the school. We have to have them today. I had a parent reach out to me from where, my, where I'm from, Montclair High School yesterday, talk about a situation where her daughter sent her a text message that they were on lockdown. These things happen because we don't have relationships. We don't have that trust. Teachers are leaving because they don't have that help from the community. They need that help. So if I had a magic wand, I would change the climate and culture, but I would also bring our village back. We need the village. Those students at AC Floor, at Dreer, at Lower Richmond, at Columbia High, at C.A. Johnson, at Eau Claire High School, those students are looking for someone that wants, that knows they care, they love them, and that they're going to be there. Those are the things that our students need. I believe that when we implement that in our schools, then we'll see our teachers be more attractive, more excited about coming into the school. They'll bring the people and everything else will fall into place. Yeah, I think it's reassurance. That's my tool. That's my wand, that's my magic wand, and that's all uh, on all levels. Horizontally, vertically, diagonally, uh, from the 
community trusting the board to do their job. The board definitely holding leadership in the school district to do their job. And, you know, when we look at safety and security, I'm asking for my district to always do their job as a parent. I mean, it's very personal to me because when I drop my son off at school, I'm looking to pick him up that same day, safe and sound. I hope that's the same sentiment for a lot of parents, even grandparents. And, and, and is it metal detectors just as a solution? No, there, there are programs like Leader and Me. There are things that we have to address as a social emotional health because social emotional loss is real from COVID. When we started reopening schools, the superintendent brought forth the plan. The first question I asked was, what is the strategy for social emotional health? Because these kids haven't been around each other. Now we put them back in this climate, in this culture, they're going to bring that climate and culture from their community back in the school. And let me be clear, it's scary when we see an uh, incident report come across our desk or in our phones that there's a gun at a certain school. It's scary that when my son was about to go to football practice, which is an outdoor event, right? And they had to close down schools at the end of the day because there was a gun in the community. Certain things like the community doing gun back, buyback, makes the, the, the metal detectors not, not a real issue. But even more than then, even more than that, I think what we have to do is what I heard from some students from Drill High School this week. I did the um, chat with the chair, which is us sitting down and just listening to the students. And I asked them about the metal detectors. What was their opinion about it? Because, yeah, adults, we have an opinion. But you know what? Listen to these children. And you know what the children at, and the students at, at Drill said? They said, we have a culture where we know each other. He said, our pride gives us assurance that we won't hurt each other. And I began to listen to these students, how they care for their community. And if we really give that reassurance across the board that each one can reach one and, and build and secure one, and the metal detector is not the solution. It's the children and us. Any last questions from the audience? Mason, I have one. Yes, sir. Let's talk about economic development for a moment. Richmond County is trying to draw businesses and people in the community. We have the highest school taxes in the state. And it goes back to one thing, I think, responsibility for finance. And we're talking about accountability and holding people accountable. <coughs> I'm very disappointed to hear that some still have their head in the sand by saying it's not the superintendent's responsibility. Everything rises and falls on the superintendent, number one. We're sitting here saying that we want to hold people accountable. Look yourself in the mirror. Fire yourself if you're not doing the job you're supposed to be doing. Don't put on your constituents. There is a problem we need to address it because we're losing businesses and we're losing people in Richmond County because of our school tax. Thank you. I have one last question. We'll wrap up. Y'all can keep it to about one minute. What can the business community, the group here, uh, resources do to help collaborate? Talk about community in the village. You can sum up in a minute what you want, you know, when you're trying to move forward with the Columbia business community, what can we help? I'd love to have that kind of conversation and have a seat at the table to see how that solution-based conversation will lead to a better tomorrow. And I think as a major partner, as a school district, you can't be afraid of that. You have to definitely um, let CEOs talk to CEOs and don't let that person talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I think it's, it's, it's a, a well-needed conversation so that um, business can stay here because at the end of the day, it's part of recruitment and retention for the teachers who are the gateway to economic development. You get a better teacher, you get a better student, you get a better community, right? And that's critical because I end with this. Um, when I was uh, at Kenya High School, I used to walk by this sign every day that means something to me right now. It said, if you can read this, thank a teacher. Therefore, I was able to read an application. I was able to read a mayor's license. By the way, the lady in the back with blonde hair, that's my wife. <laughs> um, and I was able to get a PhD with her as my classmate. So thank you. Thank you, Council. I believe that um, 
as, the, as it relates to the business community, we have to be inclusive. So I believe that we need more partnerships. We need more shadowing for our students so they can, they can see um, the future, so they can be exposed to all the wonderful business leaders and entrepreneurs that we have in this room. It opens their eyes. It gives them hope. It gives them incentive to make sure that they produce in the classroom. And it also lets them know what they can attain. So I think that as a business community, we have to uh, put more partnerships. Listen, uh, we have Eau Claire right down the road. I know Drea is not far from here, but we need to make sure that um, our schools know and feel invited. Of course, the business community is still invited into the schools, but I believe that we need to bring more partnerships where our students get exposed to what you do. And I believe that if they're exposed to what you do, then that gives them incentive to make more businesses in our um, great city. Thank you. Well, I mean, we've got to continue to build the trust with the business community, just like we have to everybody else. And, um, you know, one of the things I hear from the business community a lot is y'all are the most top heavy district in the state. Uh, that doesn't sit well with, with people who run businesses. And I think we've got to acknowledge that. Um, I think we could also do a much better job at, and I, I know some other districts do this, at really significant partnerships that are ongoing and consistent with the business community. Uh, one, so that we can tell the business community what we are doing. And two, so that we can really partner with the business community at our school levels. Um, and I was part of that in another district. It was phenomenal. And it brings the business community in and invites them to be part of a long-term uh, relationship with an individual school in a way that that business can, uh, I think, assist the school, but also learn more about what the day-to-day -day life is like at our schools uh, so that we don't only focus on, on the other stuff. Because I think everybody could, could, could stand to spend more time learning about what our teachers and staff are addressing each day. There's a, a society move, I think, that where we have kind of forgotten the whole idea of what's good for everybody is start with what's good for each individual person, child. And I think we need to keep that in mind. And that means that the business community and the schools need to, do need to partner together I think the sharing of information is very important. I think having the kids be ready for the workplaces and willing to listen to what you tell us and say, this is what I need, this is what I'm not finding, this is what the kids can or cannot do. I think you also become an important part of that whole idea of building relationships. As a partner who is in the school for a lunch or for a special activity, you may become that particular person for, for a particular child. So that, that expands those opportunities as well. And I think we need to understand that if our business people aren't happy or if our school people aren't happy, then it's a problem for everybody and we need to work together to solve it. Thank you. Barbara, last, last question, last <laughs> wrap, you wrap it up. Okay, so, well, I'd like to say that what the business community is looking for are educated people coming out of the school so that they can go into the business. And if they're not passing end of year tests or end of grade, if they're not passing, if they're on a third grade level from reading, they're not going to be of any help to the business community. The business community can't bring people in if they're going to say, well, I've got to see another district or somewhere else for the children to go to even come into the business community. So I think that the partnership that I remember and that was very important to me was when I was at communities and schools when the businesses worked within that and they came and they had the lunch with the children and um, they partnered and it was a true partnership and they became mentors. But the business community can only do what as a partner, that kind of thing, but what the district has to start to do is educate the children so that they will be a better part in coming into the business community. And we're not going to be able to do that if we don't go back and educate our children. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate it. Everybody give a round of applause for our appreciate your uh, dedication this subject matter here in your time volunteering doing this and wishing the best in your campaigns. And thank you everybody for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.